Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, multi-device storyboards for cinematic narratives in VR. And I wanted to start off by asking, how many of you like movies? Show of hands, pretty much everybody. Okay, great. Uh, how many of you have actually tried to plan a movie? And I don't mean like these WISP videos we do, I mean like something, a short or a full feature film that you would actually put in a movie theater to have people come and pay for. Has anyone actually tried that process? Okay, as many of you can imagine, I'm sure, it's a very complicated process. There's a huge number of challenges and a lot of planning that goes into it. And just to give a general idea, and I am going to generalize here because there's a whole bunch of variations to this, but in general, the way the process works is it usually starts with a script. And what happens is a director's hired who reads the script and tries to think about what they think the movie's going to look like. So they create a visual picture in their head, and this is what they start working from. But there's a problem in that this is what the director has in their head. They need to communicate it still with everybody else on their team. And so often what happens is they'll hire a storyboard artist, or if they're an artist themselves, they may sit down and start drawing uh, what's known as a storyboard, or a comic book-like representation of the film. And this is a very organic process where the director and the artist are working together. Uh, they're going through an ideation, conceptualization phase, trying to get their ideas down on paper to figure out what works best for blocking, for staging, for camera angle, uh, anything they can think of to try to make a scene that looks great. Some movies will go on to create pre-visualizations or pre-vis, uh, such as this image here from Maleficent. And this is, these are crude 3D models that are used to further explore a scene, but they're fairly slow and time consuming to make. They often take several days to several weeks to create one scene. And so um, they're not practical for ideation, but they're phenomenal for exploring a scene. But uh, this is another process that's often used and is becoming more popular. So all of these processes are guided by a whole set of nomenclature, rules, understandings that have been developed over more than 100 years. Uh, things such as arrows to show camera movement or object movement, uh, symbols to show camera shakes or tilts or different angles, uh, it's driven by techniques such as the shot type. Are you doing a close-up shot? Are you doing a, lo uh, a long shot where it's the whole body? Uh, where are you placing things in the scene? Are they in the foreground, mid-ground, background? And all these rules come together that the director and the, uh, the artist are using to create and form a visualization of your scene. And they end up creating the movies that you see in theaters today, which is um, most of us don't even notice all these things that go into it. It's just taken for granted that this vocabulary exists and these rules exist. So this, unfortunately, isn't true for all movies. I'm sure most of you, are, um, I'm sure probably everybody here is aware of Google Cardboard, Oculus Rift, or the Vive VR. And products such as these have brought the word VR, or virtual reality, into the home and the consumers. And this is an exciting new medium that has a lot of potential and a lot of ability to do um, a lot of things with. And filmmakers have noticed this too. And there's a lot of interest in creating stories for VR. And I'm going to qualify here for, by VR, what I'm referring to is everything from 360 degree uh, surround to fully immersive environments. The, the important thing is that your visual and likely your audio also will eventually be completely um, replaced with the director's vision of what they want you to see. So, again, there's a challenge here in that there's a lot of concepts that are different with VR. And it comes down to how, how do you actually plan for this? How does one consider the different things? And where our traditional films are guided by over 100 years worth of information, this is really too new a field to figure things out. There's no standardization. Every film team does their own thing. They have their own ways of approaching it. Uh, there's little material to refer to. So often uh, in traditional film, they'll say, oh, well, let's do a shot that looks something like they did in the movie here. Well, there really aren't any movies to draw from, or there are very few movies. And so these rules don't exist, and there's still an effort to understand. And consequently, a lot of film studios will rush to create a pre-visualization to have these discussions. But as I mentioned earlier, pre-visualization really is too slow a tool for that ideation stage. And consequently, there really is no, no early stage planning. And so we talked with a variety of film professionals, all who had 10 or more years of experience in film, TV, and VR. And we talked to them to try to figure out what the challenges were, what the unique challenges were for VR, uh, what the unique aspects were, the things that they had problems discussing, uh, where they felt information could be added to it, and their real frustrations. Like, how was this different than planning a traditional film? And they provided quite a few uh, different aspects and concepts, uh, things such as presence. Uh, presence is the feeling of actually being in a location. So a friend may show you a picture that they took while they were on vacation. 
and you can see that maybe they had a good time. But the idea of presence is the feeling of actually being there yourself, being in the environment and enjoying the experience with them, or having a sense of that feeling. There's a concept of no borders. My slides here, you know exactly where they are. They're framed nicely within a border due to the screen and the lighting. Now, with VR, these borders don't exist. It's a continuum that surrounds you. It's fully immersive. And so where directors will take a lot of time trying to plan out and organize and figure out layouts to fit nicely within that frame of traditional film, again, this is a very different medium, and so they don't have that same level of control. And so it causes need to approach the, uh, a lot of the problems differently. Audience attention is another big factor. Because you're in an immersive space, you have no idea exactly where the audience is looking. And so it puts an extra burden on the director who's trying to tell a story to try to lead the audience. And one of the participants we talked to discussed the way you can use techniques such as loud explosions or having virtual characters all looking in one direction to try to encourage the user to look in that direction. But if you start overusing these tools, your audience starts becoming numb to the effects and it becomes less effective. So these are all, again, problems that need to be discussed. Another interesting challenge with VR is if you're doing a live action uh, VR film, you're likely working with a camera rig that has multiple cameras mounted in different directions. And because they're not all perfectly in sync with each other, you often get these stitch lines, is what they're referred to as, um, a, basically a break between one image from one camera and the image from the other. And these are probably more commonly known from uh, street view images that we see on Google, uh, such as the eight-legged cat or the bodiless person. Um, but these are all problems again, and so directors need to lead the lead the focus of the viewer away from these stitch lines because things like this ruin the immersive experience. You suddenly remember you're in this artificial environment and so you don't want, uh, you don't want your audience to notice this. So these are just four of the considerations that came up in our discussions, the major considerations. Uh, if you're interested in more, I'd refer you to the paper. Um, but again, th there's a lot of interesting stuff there. The other thing we found is that there are very different uses or different needs for planning. So a director in a lot of the film team, for instance, really need to be in the VR space to talk about these concepts. They need to see, they need to feel, they need to, to get a sense of what it is, which is fine, and that makes sense because it's a VR environment you're planning for. The problem is, ideally for ideation, you want to do things very quickly. Uh, paper is still often used uh, for a lot of things because it's faster. But an artist doesn't really want to be in that VR space. They want something solid, they want something they can work on quickly, but also, the average person can only last for about five to ten minutes in a VR environment before they start feeling sick. So storyboard artists often work to eight to twelve hours a day, and to expect an artist to be in the VR environment for the eight to twelve hours a day, like, verges on being cruel, really. Um, also, a lot of the techniques right now rely on wand-waving wand techniques, which is a very effective technique because you feel very connected with what you're drawing. But again, to wave your arm around for eight to twelve hours a day, I don't, this is, I don't think anybody here would want to do this, and there's obviously uh, physical constraints there. So, to try to address these problems, um, we proposed an approach. And the approach is that we, needed, we realized we needed to separate the use of the different users. And so by treating the person in the VR environment as being in the center of a set of concentric cylinders, you could potentially unwrap those cylinders and display them as stereoscopic panoramic panels on a tablet, which allows the artist to still explore the space in depth, like looking at the different um, cylinders in that, so they can still create images with depth, but at the same time, the film team members, the directors, the producers can be in the VR environment and see the results immersively. And so there's kind of a marrying of the best of both worlds here where the two are working together and creating a, um, a cohesive um, approach. So another nice aspect of this is that there are actually a whole bunch of different workflows, but for the sake of today's talk, I'm just going to focus on the one where the artist is working on the tablet and the director's actually in the VR environment. So to check, to see how well this worked, to see if this was actually a practical solution, we built a prototype. Uh, we used a Microsoft Surface 2 and uh, Oculus Rift DK2 for the tablet and VR environment, and they communicated with each other over a local area network using UDP messaging, if anyone cares. Um, so the main user interface for this is the artist. We're working with sketches and drawings, and so the artist needs to be able to sketch into the space, and so they work by sketching, and that's kind of the main input form. Um, however, we don't display the whole panoramic panel all at the same time. To maximize the amount of space, uh, we actually show a subset that the user can pan around within, and this subset, this, this 
kind of constrained view is what the person in the VR environment would see. So this actually matches the field of view of the VR environment. And so this way, again, while having discussions, the director and the artist are seeing very similar things. As well, um, it's important to visualize the overall scene. Because the artist is working on a 2D surface, they're, they're more disconnected from the environment. And so we still want them to be able to explore and get a sense of these, this 3D space in the cylinders. And so we've introduced an overhead view, which allows the artist on the tablet to see where things are placed, which cylinders they're placed on, and how they fit into the environment, uh, even though it's a, still a 2D space. This is further uh, enhanced by a viewing wedge uh, which can be moved around uh, with the viewing wedge shows is uh, rendered in the upper corner and as a thumbnail and this can be moved around to show different angles that the person in the VR environment can potentially see. Uh, also, as with traditional storyboards, we have a storyboard view for the tablet as well. These are panoramic panels rather than small scenes because we're looking at larger environments. But we've enhanced these as well. Uh, audience attention is one of the things I've mentioned earlier. Well, we have these little green focus boxes to try to show the progression of the audience intention, where the audience should be looking or where you hope they're looking if you've done your job as a director. Uh, this is further embellished with a gradient on either side to help show what really people shouldn't be looking at versus what they should be. Now, while the artist is working on the tablet, the director's in the virtual environment. They're looking around, they're seeing, they're talking, they're trying to explain uh, what they're thinking and communicating. And so, in the VR environment, they're looking at a very similar sketching surface, except, again, this is wrapped around the users. This, these are actually the concentric cylinders in their actual locations. And the director can look in any direction, can freely explore, uh, and have that conversation. The other thing we found that when we started this is nobody, like none of the professionals that we talked with, knew what a storyboard would look like in VR. Um, and so, we actually proposed a concept um, where we looked at creating miniatures of each of the panels, each of the scenes. And these can be displayed around the user as, as little dioramas or little miniatures um, to give a, kind of a micro scene management of the overall, the overall environment. Um, so again, this is kind of a god mode where the director can get a sense of each scene, each moment, all in one shot very quickly. So again, we have two users in different environments. And one of the big challenges, I should first say that um, what we're looking at here is on the left is the VR environment, and on the right is the sketch tablet. And what the, um, there's a lifetime update on both. So when the artist is drawing, the director is seeing it right away. So again, the conversations can be have, had. Uh, but there's also another added challenge in that because the director is in the VR environment, they have this visual barrier blocking them from seeing the tablet, from seeing the artist, and it makes the communication a lot more difficult. And so we've created a number of indicators to help with this discussion. So some of you may have noticed on the left in the VR environment, there's this little uh, box here. And this box shows the location that the tablet is currently focused on. So this tells the director that if they want to see where the content's being added, they need to look at this box, or if they're referring to something. If the artist starts saying something, referring to uh, what they're doing, they know that they need to look at, uh, at that space. Um, this is also echoed in on the tablet. There's a red bar at the bottom that shows the direction that the person in VR is currently looking. Uh, so that, again, when the director makes a comment, the artist, even though they can't see the VR environment, knows where to look. Uh, this is also echoed on the overhead view uh, with a wedge in the middle of the, of the circle. So using all these different tools, it allows the director and artist to talk and work together. And it was a system that seemed to work well, but we needed to validate it to see you know, whether, whether this did actually cover some of the challenges. And so we approached um, four individuals, a director and producer from an award-winning VR team, uh, an award-winning director from a stereo 3D and VR company, and a director producer from a prominent VR um, company, to, to try to see whether uh, this had potential. And we, we weren't interested in whether we had the best approach. Uh, we weren't interested in what little things would make the system better, although it's always interesting to hear those things. What we really wanted to do was validate the approach. Was this workable? Could this be worked into their current workflows? Did they feel that this could improve what they were doing? And so, we got a lot of positive response. There were a few suggestions that could help the system, but overall, all, and I'll refer you to the paper for those if you're interested, but overall, the feedback was very positive. So from a prep side, it's a huge step forward, was one of the comments. Uh, the simultaneous view in the head-mounted display is amazing. It hits hands down. 
as well, uh, two system the two-system approach allowed artists to intuitively block things in, which is really important, again, when you remember that the artist is trying to work in an environment that they can't really see. Uh, being able to toggle back and forth between the panels is awesome. Um, with the storyboard itself, the fact that you can see the audience tension go scene one, scene two, scene three, and just see the subtle difference was nice. And that they felt that it allowed for creative collaboration where the director and the artist were able to be in the same space and bounce things off of one another. So this suggests that we did in fact achieve a system that would allow for this um, and ha has potential for further exploration. So I wanted to summarize that we've uh, started off by exploring planning for VR stories. Uh, we identified key challenges that they have to talk about while planning these environments. That we proposed an approach of decoupling the VR space and the drawing platform that the two, uh, the different groups of teams need to work with. Um, we implemented a prototype to test the approach and we asserted, uh, assessed the validity of the suggestion. And again, this is the first time tool that addressed these specific challenges in VR to allow people to have these discussions. So what I really want to leave you with today, though, is that we feel that we've shown that the, the multi-device approach has a lot of potential, but we've barely scratched the surface. We've just simply opened the door to this possible area. And whether you're interested in bi-manual input, a sketching language, augmented real 3D sketching, visualization, or something else completely that we're to the two environments, um, there's a lot of potential here to still explore. And so I invite you to join in and explore this exciting space and see what else we can come up with to start this dialogue to make VR um, more interesting and more fun to play with. So that I want to thank my uh, colleagues Bruno, Fanny, Karan, and Rabin and open the floor for questions. Hi, it's Tokyo from Kai. This is great work. Um, uh, it looks like for the single viewpoint applications, maybe for the real production process, uh, the camera should walk or move or sometimes fly, and then the, all the scenes should be reproduced. How can you handle? So um, one thing I didn't talk about in the presentation is that in the VR environment, you can actually walk around. Uh, these are flat surfaces, but uh, if directors want to get a slightly different angle, like what if the, you see it from over here, it's generally still enough to get a sense. And the idea at this point is that you're, it, it's an ideation stage. So if you don't like it, you might scrap it and start with something new. Um, but ideally, if there's a sequence of things going on, you probably want a series of, uh, of environments to, to show that sequence. So. Uh, you can do it that way, or you can, um, I also didn't talk about the fact that the, art, uh, the director can make annotations that they can toggle on or off, and so they can actually discuss things and show, uh, show different things in progression. Thank you. Hi, I was wondering if the panoramic views allowed for sort of, you know, looking up to the sky and looking down at the feet, and how could you actually make that two-dimensional for the artist. Yeah, so, um, so from a, a drawing point of view, uh, you, again, there, there's a cone that you're looking at, uh, like a frustrum. Um, so at the distance, you definitely can see quite high. Up close, because of the scale, you can actually see a fair amount, but there is definitely a restriction with that. Uh, there would be a potential that we didn't explore with this of being able to pan the camera possibly up or down. Um, to, to try to get more of a sense of that. But generally, um, the idea of this is for to have the discussion. And you know, there, there may need to be support uh, for certain environments where that would be necessary. But that's something we, we did not explore at this point. Thank you. All right, uh, let's thank our speaker again. And uh,